Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the Zentrum Altertumswissenschaften Zürich uh, to this lecture tonight. It's a specific pleasure for me that we can meet in person again and uh, that this lecture can take place uh, in the form of a live audience and also of a live speaker. My name is Konrad Schmid. I'm teaching Hebrew Bible and Ancient Juda uh, Judaism at the, uni at the Faculty of Theology at the University of uh, Zurich. And uh, I have the privilege to introduce Professor Mark Geller, the Jewish Chronicle Professor of Jewish Studies at University College London at this year's, as this year's Zatz guest professor. It's neither uh, easy nor fun to travel these days, so we are all the more grateful that your wife, Professor Florentina Batalanova Geller and you, Uh, were able to make your way to Zurich yesterday and we are very glad that the two of you will be with us for the next three days. Professor Mark Geller is trained in classics and got his first degree from Princeton, which uh, also included a stay at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 1974, he completed his PhD at Brandeis University in Mediterranean studies on the topic of Aramaic magic bowls in relation to rabbinic texts. And in 1976, Professor uh, Geller came to London where he studied Akkadian and Sumerian for several uh, years with Wilfred G. Lambert. A few years later, in 1980-1981, he was a Humboldt Fellow at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich at the Institute of Assyriology and Hittitology, where he worked with another most notable scholar in Assyriology, Dietz Otto Etzart. His topic there were Sumerian incantation texts that highlight and uh, continued his interest in ancient uh, magic and medicine. And since Munich, Professor Geller is a Humboldtian and he was able to con continue his research in Germany throughout several stays in Berlin, Jena and Leipzig. Uh, particularly important place for him and also his wife in German is in Germany is the Max Planck Institute for Wissenschaftsgeschichte Berlin with which he is very familiar several research stays led them there in the past years in 1994 and 1995, Professor Geller was a fellow of the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies in Wassenaar, a most fitting member of a research group on magic and religion in the ancient Near East. A second stay in Wassenaar in 2000-2001 was dedicated to work in a group of scholars dealing with Greek and Babylonian medicine. And in 2005-2006, he spent a year at the Collège de France and uh, in Paris working with Jean-Marie Durand. And the result of this stay was the book Ancient Babylonian Medicine, Theory and Practice, which was published by Wiley and Blackwell in 2010. In 2013, He was awarded an ERC advanced grant on Babylonian medicine, a very prestigious project that uh, ran for five years. Professor Geller has been serving as director of the Institute of Jewish Studies at University College London, in which capacity he convened many conferences. Professor Geller's studies basically cover the whole period from some of the earliest cuneiform texts in Sumerian in the third millennium uh, BCE to the disappearance of cuneiform, which was as late as the third century CE. 
His research deals with sources in Sumerian, Akkadian, Ugaritic, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and this is not an exhaustive list. His research is available in nine books and over 130 articles. As an entry to his field, I would recommend his Ancient Babylonian Medicine, Theory, and Practice, which I mentioned uh, before. Professor Keller holds a honorary degree from Sofia University, uh, Bulgaria, and in uh, 2018, he was honored by a festschrift published by Brill entitled Mesopotamian Magic and Me Mesopotamian Medicine and Magic. Given this academic track record and his expertise in ancient Babylonian medicine, I think it was nearly unavoidable to try to convince Professor Geller to accept our invitation as uh, Zatz guest professor in the pandemic year of 2021. The Tzatz devoted its annual lecture series or devotes its annual lecture series to the topic of catastrophes, pandemics and plagues. And we thought we like to include a prominent voice of someone in our uh, activities who is an expert in ancient medicine. It didn't take as long to detect Professor Geller among these specialists, and therefore we're most uh, grateful to be able to welcome you in Zurich. And your topic tonight will be Who Controls the Narrative, Religion versus Science in Babylonian Medicine? The floor is yours, Professor Geller. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frau Thank you very much, Conrad, for this very... Uh, I always think when I hear these kind of introductions that you, someone must be talking about somebody else. But thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be here this evening. And of course, we uh, können uh, auch später in den Deutschen unterhalten, aber bitte nur Hochdeutsch. So this is... Uh, so it's... And I have a lot to say because medicine is a big topic and a very complicated topic. So I hope I won't speak for too long. If I speak for too long, you can just uh, uh, stop me and then we can uh, get on with the discussion. But I'm going to try to be a little bit controversial and try to raise some issues that uh, we'll be able to think about and to uh, discuss and to even argue about uh, later on uh, after my few remarks. Now, uh, the usual approach... Oh, let me just make sure I can use this properly. Is this going? Yes. So the usual approach to Babylonian medical writings is to assume a monolithic corpus of data presented in either recipes or lists of drugs or collections of symptoms for prognosis and diagnosis. And these either belong to the cadre of the, of the official Asu physician or the Ashipu exorcist. Now, the material is usually divided into binary categories of medicine and magic, with the gray area, some sort of gray area in between, belonging to witchcraft. And this spans both genres. Huh? So, witchcraft has a little bit of medicine and a little bit of magic. Huh? Now, this approach to Babylonian medicine doesn't compare very well with Greek and later Roman medicine, which developed competing schools or philosophies in the medical arena, such as Methodists and dogmatists and empiricists and others who incessantly argued about whether theory or practice was the crucial component of medicine or whether the physician needed to be a philosopher as well as a doctor. And even within Hippocratic medicine, different voices can be heard. These voices are easier to identify when names can be attached to their writings, such as the great Alexandrian anatomist Herophilus, who actually dissected human bodies, or Diocles of Charistus, whose works weren't well-preserved, they only exist in fragments. But nevertheless, 
this multivalent character of Greek medicine with its different approaches to understanding disease and therapies is universally accepted. So why should Babylonian medicine have been so harmonious without dissenting opinions or approaches? You can see our lonely Babylonian staying here in contrast to the many faces of, the, of Greek medical uh, writings, dissent, disagreements, etc., hmm? philosophies. And even when we look back from our own modern perspective, we see how unlikely it is for anything in the ancient Semitic world to have been unanimous and without conflicting opinions. Furthermore, considering the length of the period of documentation of Babylonian medicine, we're talking about nearly two millennia. We never seem to view the acquisition of medical knowledge as a dynamic process, which also needs to adapt to changing expectations. So we will survey this evening Babylonian medicine together while we're doing this together, but at the same time seeking out this, what we're looking for is a cacophony of different voices. Now, the oldest era providing data on Babylonian medicine is the so-called Old Babylonian period, roughly contemporary with Hammurabi of Babylon. We're talking about 18th century BCE, right? But this is not very complete. It gives us a very incomplete picture of diagnosis and therapy because of the many gaps in the textual record. But what's clear is that there was a relatively very uh, distinct, uh, dis clear distinction between medical and magical therapies. That medical texts from this period don't generally include magical incantations together with the medical prescription. So there's medicine and magic are really separated. Moreover, the prescriptions which, are, which we do have preserved generally, re generally reflect simple recipes, what the French call simple. In other words, single drugs used against a single disease. Now this, in fact, this transition from simple to compound recipes now, compound recipes use numerous plants and minerals as drugs, and this may indicate a kind of improved knowledge of pharmacology. Since compound recipes may have reached, they have included additional drugs, why would you do this? Because you have to counteract side effects, neighbor effects, uh -huh, from a prescription. Huh? So if you have an ingredient against fever, you find the patient suddenly gets a uh, stomach Ache. So then you have to put an ingredient against the stomach ache, huh? and then the stomach ache ingredient causes something else, so you add another ingredient against that. Huh? We know this from, from modern pharmacology. Huh? So the extent of this process, it's really difficult, though, for us to assess because the, mass, the vast majorities of these drugs in the Babylonian pharmacy are unidentified. So we have the names of the drugs, but we can't really relate them to, we can't really identify what they are in terms of the actual plants and minerals. Huh? This is a huge problem. But, so just to show you, sorry, if I can I go back? Mm -hmm. Just to show you, this middle, by the time, in the end of, the, of this the second millennium, we're getting these compound recipes, as opposed to here, you can see very single or double lines, each is a single recipe, one drug against a single disease, so they're very short, small. These are, we're gonna see are very, examples of compound recipes. Huh? So it's already beginning, but this is a period of almost a thousand years. Now, by the, so this, by the end of this millennium, the second millennium, Babylonian physicians were producing elaborate prescriptions, which formed the basis of medical, for all medical therapies in later periods. But these also included specially designed medical incantations and medical rituals with the prescriptions. So we have Medi medical incantations with the prescriptions, with the recipes. So magic was becoming a normal part of medicine. Although medical magic was different from the magic of exorcisms and other kinds of sort of lose rituale. Huh? They're different. Now we'll see why. We're going to see one in a Now you can see an example here. This is a nice example. So if you look at the 
text on the left and on the bottom, that's all one text. Take, you see, it says there that, let's well, see if I can use this pointer thing. Does this work? Uh, whoop. There are 90 drugs, do you see? There's a compound recipe. Now this incantation is actually quite interesting. You see, because if you read it, he says, the patient suffering from a disease, you, uh, you're addressing this to Gula, the goddess of healing, and then it says, suddenly, it says, for whatever illness with which I am sick, and do you know what I know? Am I to drink this drug? Huh? So well, who's the I? Well, the I is probably the patient. So these incantations are there to give the patient some confidence in the therapy, huh? to make it more humane. It's not just a technical affair, just a technical matter of take these drugs, take these aspirin and go to bed, but it has to do with a kind of a, a patient having a relationship with his illness, a different kind of relationship. Now, there was a 12th century Babylonian BCE scholar named Asagil Kin Apli. And he became very famous as a compiler of, major, of a major new medical corpus. This Grossmeister, he was credited with editing an enormous number of medical, magical, and diagnostic texts. So you might think of him as a sort of Babylonian Hippocrates. Now, in both of these cases of Hippocrates and Isagilkin Apli, the Babylonian and the Greek medical corpora were much, much too large, too multifaceted to have realistically been created by a single man, single scholar, single individual. But it was convenient in both instances to be able to assign authorship, to attribute authorship, huh? to attach a name to a corpus. And so the legacy attributed to Asagil Kin Apli is considerable, huh? preserved in three lengthy cuneiform catalogs listing loads and loads of myriad of tablets. Now these tablets are compositions. They're like tractates. Huh? They're like, uh, so you, you get the idea that these are tablets on medicine, magic, and diagnosis. Can you see that there are three? Now all of these are catalogs and each, each catalog here is a list of Einträge. So every Eintrag represents a different text. Huh? So you can see the large numbers of texts that are being referred to, to here. Huh? But there are three separate disciplines of healing arts, of Heilkunde. Huh? So while we read endless arguments in the literature among scholars about who was treating patients, was it the exorcist, or was it the physician, a kind of who did what to whom kind of question, we can see from these catalogs that this question is almost irrelevant. Why? Because these are three independent disciplines and they existed side by side and they were used by anyone who wished to consult them. So this is a very important distinction now. Now in the 7th century BC, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal the famous Ashurbanipal, assigned his cohort of expert scribes to create the standard editions of all medical and magical lore. So this is 400 years after Esagil Kenapli. Huh? And this was done within the framework of his Nineveh Royal Library. Huh? But the colophons from this Royal Library indicate that this genre of medical texts didn't exist before in a traditional in a traditional form. They weren't just inheriting medicine uh, that was already very fixed and just copying it. They were creating new editions of medical texts, even though they attributed them to Esagil Kenapli 400 years earlier. Now his scribes, Ashurbanipal's scribes, were responsible for creating new standard editions, which later influenced the archives in Babylon, Uruk, Sippar, Borsippa, all the other important sites and centers in Mesopotamia. However, this, within this enormous effort at standardizing all medical knowledge, we can still detect the presence of conflicting opinions and different approaches to therapy. And that's what we want to look at now. What are these conflicting opinions? Oops. Now, within the province of medicine proper, now we're excluding healing magic here. We're talking about medicine. 
This Asher medical catalog, I showed you the picture of it before, it's the one in the middle. It's new, this was recently uh, put together by different fragments by the ERC team in Berlin a few years ago. This exists at some, of some 90 different treatises, tractate, with their opening lines or insipids, as I mentioned. These are titles of compositions. Now, it's astonishing to realize that this newly discovered list of 90 medical works was completed some two centuries before Hippocrates. Every textbook of ancient medicine says Hippocrates is the father of ancient medicine. This is two centuries before Hippocrates, 90 medical works recorded on this catalog. These are organized into two different categories. The first listing all treatises dealing with the diseases associated with parts of the anatomy. You can see uh, starting head to foot. You can see cranium, eyes, ears, neck. This is how they organize them. Epigastrium, abdomen, kidney, rectum, legs, huh? feet, etc. And then turn the tablet to the, uh, to the reverse, Second group of texts, these are general conditions, general syn syndromes, medical syndromes of a more universal nature. So dermatology, uh, wounds, a feeling of being affected by divine anger, anxiety. This also includes stroke, paralysis, worry, impotence, gynecology, and veterinary medicine. So these are very different kinds of the obverse and the reverse have very different kinds of, of treatises. Hmm? Now this is not really, by modern standards, we can't say this is a taxonomy of disease, but it does show a general pattern of distinguishing between anatomical and non-anatomical diseases and conditions. This is a major way that ancient medicine treats disease. Is it associated with a specific part of the body or not? Now the medical treatments are complex. They use utilizing a large repertoire, hundreds of organic and non-organic compounds, numerous forms of manipulating the ingredients in preparation for administering them. Huh? Various methods, huh? you can use, you can swallow them, you can drink them, you can have clisters uh, through the rectum, bandages, massage, fumigation, all different ways. Huh? Now, uh, we even have a little bit on surgery, but that's probably utterlas. Huh? opening of the veins, huh? but that's pretty rare, not much surgery. Now, the question is, how does this compare with the Hippocratic corpus in general? Can we make any general comparisons with it? It turns out to be three major differences. So number one, Babylonian medicine lacks any discussion of medical theory. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't have medical theory, but they don't discuss medical theory. So they don't ever discuss a theory of bodily humors, for instance. Huh? Or they don't discuss principle of opposites, cold versus hot, dry versus wet, dry versus moist, etc. Huh? This, is, this is what we find in Greek medicine. We don't find discussions of these. There's no, and that's part of the reason, because Babylonian medicine didn't didn't write about theory. It wasn't a literary genre. Huh? And so it means theory was rather implicit rather than ex explicit. Hmm? And there was certainly room for conflicting theories. The second thing is that Babylonian recipes, they incorporate a fair amount of what we usually consider to be magic, as I mentioned earlier, incantations and rituals. But these medical incantations, as I mentioned, as we'll see in a minute, differ very much from the exorcistic incantations of the Sumerian and Akkadian magical corpus. And three, prognosis and diagnosis were formal tasks of the exorcist priest, not the doctor. And a lengthy compendium of diagnostic omens, called symptoms, called the Diagnostic Handbook, what we will talk about in a minute, was attributed to a special exorcist, but not the physician. Hmm? So that's one of the, these are three general major differences with Greek. Now, let's go to this diagnostic handbook. It contains about 15,000 diagnostic omens, all collected on tablets, series of tablets. This, it is collected into a single compendium. And it's one of the three categories that I showed you from Isago Kinapli. 
So this is the discipline of diagnosis based on symptoms. Now, an excellent, there's an excellent German study, incidentally, of this diagnostic handbook published in 2000 by Niels Hazel, and we're going to hear from Niels Hazel again in a few minutes. But one thing is very unexpected. The descriptions of the symptoms in the medical recipes often differ from the symptoms in the diagnostic omens. Now, this is rather strange, because you think if you're a doctor and you want to note the symptoms of a patient, you just look it up in the diagnostic handbook and you make a note. But the symptom descriptions are not the same between the recipes and these collections of medical omens. So you can see it here. If you look, for instance, here, you can see on the left, this is a therapeutic text. If his urine is yellow, if his urine is white, if his urine is like a stone, normal, etc. These are medical recipes. If you look on the right-hand side, the descriptions are told also of urine are very different. If his urine is red, if it's black, if it's continually blocked up. So there's no overlap at all between these same notations of symptoms. And that's very strange. For us, that's very strange. Now, the binary opposition of magic and medicine within Babylonian Heilkunde has never really been properly resolved. What's going on here? Is it, some people believe it's really just two sides of the same coin. Magic and medicine are sort of complementary. It's more or less it's the same. Other people say, no, no, these are radically different approaches to therapy. But one thing that we can all agree with, I think, that magic and medicine in Mesopotamia were, so it was in some respects complementary, because any theory of medicine has to take magic into account. And that's the, that's the important point here. Hmm? But the problem is, what is magic? It covers a very broad spectrum of activity and belief. Huh? And much of this doesn't have very much to do with healing arts. So a lot of magic has nothing to do with healing at all. Hmm? Uh, but there's a large part of it that certainly does. Now, so one of the key issues in studies of Babylonian medicine is very important uh, here, of course, in, also in Zurich, is to the extent, what extent the gods and religion in general, what kind of role they had to play within diagnosis and therapy. Now, there are a lot of different opinions in regard to this, whether the gods were perceived as playing a decisive role in determining outcomes or not, huh? or whether Babylonian medicine had developed a somewhat more secular approach to therapy, which it didn't contradict belief in the gods, but at the same time, it didn't rely upon the gods, upon divine assistance as a factor in identifying and treating disease. There's a big difference here. So it's not atheism we're talking about. We're just talking about the fact of, do you attribute the causes of disease to gods or not? It's a crucial point here. Now, this is a point of contention between scholars. Huh? And this point of contention often revolves around a single expression that's commonly encountered in medical texts, that a particular disease was associated with the hand of a god. And here our friend Neil Hessel appears again because he's probably the most outspoken proponent of the idea of the hand of the God is really the divine causal agent of an illness. These are his words. Usually instigated by the patient having broken a taboo, either intentionally or accidentally. Therefore, Hand of the God represents the personal interest of the God in this patient, huh? in his illness. So for Hazel, this information, in his worldview, the basic meaning of hand of a God, this phrase was essentially religious, that the patient's disease resulted from the personal interventions rather than from natural causes. However, while Hazel has offered seemingly convincing explanation based on a very literal reading of the text, of the data, there's another way of examining the same evidence which reaches very different conclusions. My own detailed counter-argument, laying out the case for a non-religious interpretation of the hand of a deity, ghost, or demon, it remains unanswered, so I think I'm fair, it's fair enough for me to talk about it here this evening. The main thesis 
against personal involvement of the deity was that the hand of a god formulation was typical of omens and divination texts, which freely associated events with gods, with divine activity. But omens were never intended to identify causality. This is what Francesca Rochberg had pointed out. You can see her here on the slide. That Babylonian science wasn't oriented, or say Wissenschaften in general, it wasn't, this wasn't oriented towards causation or causes, but it operated by associating events in this logic of if P, then Q. If P occurs, then Q may occur. So these are associated, it's an associated relationship. It's not a causative relationship. So the description of symptoms of a hand of a god, it's not intended to identify the causation of the disease, cause of the disease, but simply that the disease, not the patient, the disease has some kind of association with a particular deity or demon or ghost. So the medical diagnostic, this diagnostic handbook, it's interesting because it employs the methodology of omens, of divination, not medicine. This long list of 15,000 symptoms. Huh? And we know this because the first two chapters of this diagnostic handbook resemble the omens of everyday life. There's a special compendium called Shuma Alu omens, terrestrial omens. These are omens about what can, anything that can happen in everyday life and they're omens for what, how it's going to affect you. Now in these tablets, in these two opening tablets of the diagnostic textbook, we find things like if the healer encountered a pig or a brick or a pregnant woman en route while he's going off to see the patient to give his diagnosis, this will indicate that the patient will probably die. Now, why is that? Well, it's probably one comes and one goes. If you see a pregnant woman, that's probably a sign that someone's coming, so your patient is probably then on the way out. So it makes, there's a sort of logic here. But this diagnostic handbook with its impressive 15,000 entries wasn't, this is the mistake that many people make, it was not describing the symptoms of individual patients, but these were symptoms associated with diseases. We don't know how many patients would have been suffering from this particular symptom of the disease. It could be 50 patients for every entry. We don't know. Huh? They're not about individual patients. That's important. So if this is the case, that it's not about individual patients but about disease, then the hand of the God can't really refer to the God taking an interest in an individual patient because these symptoms aren't about individual patients. They're about disease. So this, I think, is really... But we do find, however, I'll give you one example, though. Oh, yes, there's one, one, there are some cases even where the hand of a god disease can develop into another disease. So you can start off with, uh, you can start off with a stroke and you can end up with epilepsy, something like this. Huh? You can, diseases can merge. So, so these are all technical matters of disease that don't really have anything to do with the personal interests of, of the gods. Huh? And even here, you see at the end, the bottom, something else I wanted to show you. You can see here that you have one, cha one tablet, 33rd tablet of this diagnostic textbook, has a list of hand of the gods on one column and technical names for diseases on the other column. And I think that's because people were wanted more they, they were having expectations for more technical medicine. They wanted the diseases not just to be known as hand of a particular god. They wanted to have a technical name for this, for a, for a specific disease. So, so let's, but there's more to this story. So we need to explore this rationale behind this if P then Q type of logic in these diagnostic omens. And there's an underlying supposition in my argument that if we can find rational explanations for associating disease symptoms with certain gods or demons or ghosts, this weakens the argument for a deity or a demon's personal involvement or intervention in the patient's suffering or therapy. So let's see if we can find this. So one of the ways of explaining 
this hand of the ghost or a god or a demon can be understood in an environment of infectious diseases or epidemics, or as we call it today, pandemics, like COVID-19, for which there were no effective countermeasures beyond strict hygiene and even quarantine. Doesn't that sound familiar? Wash your hands and keep two meters away from everyone. This was really the recipes. These were the instructions of the ancient world as well. Now, one reason for associating disease symptoms with gods is because the divine names themselves were associated with specific institutions or activities which were perceived as potential arenas in which diseases could spread in the form of these pernicious or deadly pandemics. So one example is the goddess Ishtar, for instance. She's a goddess of love. She's associated certainly with brothels and with symptoms associated with Kadian Naku fornication. Now similarly, the toilet demon Shulak, his hand was invoked, the hand of Shulak, because this alludes to these hygiene dangers which latrines posed. You can imagine what ancient latrines were like. And were recognized, this was recognized in antiquity as, as dangerous. Symptoms associated with this bellicose war deity Nergal could be associated with army encampments, notorious for the spread of disease. We know this uh, from lit- literature. The sun god Shamash was the patron god of justice. Law courts were another possible arena where cow- crowds would gather, while Marduk, as head of the pantheon, represented the royal palace, another potential area for contamination people coming together, eh? large numbers. So the storm god Adad, on the other hand, may have associated disease with inclement weather or floods, and all these associations were introduced by invoking the hand of these deities. So the hand of the deity of a city god, for instance, is very self-explanatory because you have the marketplaces and the gatherings for people. All of these were dangerous places. So these are ration, there's a rationality behind these assumptions, these references to the hand of a deity within these omen contexts. Now let's just look at a few other examples of this. Huh? So you have a list of symptoms here, and then you say, well, it's the hand of the ghost. So the hand of the ghost becomes a label for a kind of disease, an ailment. Huh? So he has, he has uh, hurting temples, blood flowing from his nose. They're all different, huh? His neck sinews hurt him, uh, maybe like meningitis kind of thing. His eyes hurt him, etc. All these with this. So he has headache plus all these other symptoms. Each one of these has a label, hand of a ghost. And hand of a ghost then becomes a label for a certain kind of, of ailment. But does it really mean that the, ha- that the ghost was there personally taking part? Well, let's examine this. In this diagnostic handbook... The book, this handbook frequently refers to the ghosts of father or mother or brother or sister or simply family ghosts, all of which are easy now for us to comprehend under conditions of epidemics. When family life and close proximities present serious threats to personal health. We saw this with COVID. COVID runs right through families. So it's easy to imagine that as successive members of the same family succumbed to a highly infectious virus or pathogen, the ghosts of the deceased would be associated with the symptoms in any surviving family member. We've all experienced this now with COVID-19. Now one final argument for a different view of the hand of the ghost is that these designations aren't evenly distributed within the medical literature. And this is something that somehow has escaped notice. So this expression, hand, bless a god, hand of Ishtar, hand of Marduk, etc., it's rare within the medical recipes themselves. So it's in this medical handbook, the diagnostic handbook, but not in medical recipes. Why? It's not in the prescriptions because these medical recipes rarely offer prognoses. The doctor there was to offer the, the treatment. He wasn't to tell you how long is, you're, you're, whether you're going to live or die and how long you might be ill for. Huh? He doesn't offer prognosis. He just offers remedies. Now, 
we mentioned earlier, do you remember that we said it was the exorcist who, and not the doctor, who visits the patient at home and diagnoses the disease or told, her, told him how much longer he or she had to live. Huh? Now, from a modern perspective, we think of the diagnostic handbook as, and therapeutic recipes as part of the same thing. We put them all under the heading of medicine, since they both deal with disease symptoms. But in fact, these texts originated within very different scribal workshops, different ateliers, reflecting different attitudes. This diagnostic handbook belonged to a sort of healer priesthood. And of course, they were aware of the benefits to patients of placing gods and demons and ghosts in the forefront of the diagnosis huh? as a way of explaining the presence of disease within the popular culture, something everybody could understand. Huh? But even within the diagnostic handbook, there's an unnoticed process was taking place, even within these sort of clerical circles. See, the tendency is in Mesopotamia is that you get these long composition, composition series that are based on series of tablets, tablet one, two, three, four, five, and what happens is we start off with a sort of core group of these tablets, and as time goes on, you add more tablets to the composition, and the, ta and the composition grows. But the latter tablets are later tablets. Huh? Now, if a simple perusal of the hand of the god notations in the diagnostic handbook shows that this notation occurs more frequently in the earlier tablets, and it's probably the older tablets of the series, and later on, the number of references to hands of gods or demons or ghosts declines dramatically. And I think the possible explanation is there's a tendency for these later, latter tablets of this diagnostic handbook that they were... They come from a later period when expectations were already arising for more accurate diagnoses. Hmm? There was an increased pressure mounting for technical terms for disease to replace the rather vague associations of hands of the gods, hmm? even if they're used for labels of disease. They're just not satisfactory. Hmm? Nevertheless, this doesn't mean that we should discount or ignore those passages which refer to the hand of a god or hand of a ghost or hand of a demon, since it's probable that many exorcists and maybe even physicians, even in later periods, preferred to remain with this traditional designation of disease as having a more religious orientation. This may also reflect the fact that technical disease names are often difficult for an average person to understand. As mentioned above, it's important to register and give credit to dissenting voices. That's what we're looking for here. Now, is that all right? <laughs> I, okay, so I, I, I still have a little bit more things to tell you. Should, but I'm all right for time? Yeah, it's true. Really just ignore it. It's just. Uh, <laughs> so. So. Let's just to review this, this question of the direct involvement of deities and demons in medicine. I want to talk about incantations within medical recipes. Hmm? So this gave the Babylonian and even the Egyptian physicians, it gave them a reputation, certainly from a Greek point of view, that they were influenced by magic. Hmm? And of course, in comparison with the Hippocratic colleagues, we don't find magic in the Hippocratic corpus to any great extent. Now, within the Babylonian sphere, medical incantations and rituals were perf performed key explanatory functions, which couldn't be accommodated by the actual recipes. So they add additional information. So for the most part, these medical incantations, we refer to them as rituals, really they're medical procedures. They offered etiologies of disease in order to attempt to explain the origins and the characteristics of illnesses. This is because explanatory philosophical or didactic writings on this Greek model, hmm, philosophical writings, they weren't simply part of Babylonian literary culture. 
philosophy, philosophical writing was a really a Greek invention. Hmm? Now, but these Babylonian medical incantations had little in common with the magical spells within the magical compendia. These, these other magical texts, you adjure demons and ghosts and you direct prayer-like appeals to deities. That's really classic magic. That's not what we find in the medical corpus. These medical incantations also don't allude to this very famous conversation called the Marduk Eya formula, where Marduk, the god, goes to his father Eya and says, I noticed something wrong with this pa- patient, and what, what can I do for him? Uh, this, this is all pure magic. And Eya says, well, actually, I don't know more than you know, but if, since you ask me, I suggest you do this. And uh, this, this becomes a ritual in the magical incantation. Of course, for the patient, this is very reassuring. He doesn't just get an incantation or a ritual that's created by the incantation priest, but it comes right from the gods on high. So it's a very, and you don't find this in our medical incantations. It's not, there are a couple of exceptions, but almost uh, it's very rare. Now, there's an example of a medical incantation. I've given it to you. It's very difficult to decipher... It's in a recipe for stomach disorders. And the surface of this is, it appears to be, it appears to refer to the goddess Zarpanitu, Zarpanitu, who's the spouse of Marduk, and to the god Enlil. But neither of these gods has any associations with stomach illness. So why would they be mentioned in this medical incantation? Now it turns out that these allusions to these major gods they turn out to be a sort of double entendre huh? on stomach, stomach pains and stomach ailments huh? because they refer to wind or, or flatulence. Huh? Yes, a sort of burning ses- sensation or heartburn, huh? Bauchschmerzen. Huh? So the difficulty, it's a very picturesque te- text. It's composed in a series of Sumerian logograms intended to be read out in Canadian, in Acadian, sorry, in ca- Acadian, but... It's meant to look mythological, but when you actually read and interpret the text, uh, what you find is in the incantation itself, there's a great mountain lady, and the word for lady is actually a word for fever, hmm? and then the windpipe is called the reed of Enlil. Of course, Enlil's name means Lord Wind. So it turns out that the wind, this is really the uh, Luftrohr that is being talked about here, it doesn't exude blood. It's a burning sensation. And the word for burning sensation is zarpanitum, but it looks like it's the goddess zarpanitum, but it really isn't. It's just an allegory for this idea of this burning sensation. And then it says that the patient has to be placed upside down in this incantation. And the recipe after this text says that you have to turn the patient upside down. This is the actual medical instruction. So the incantation is a way of explaining and legitimizing the actual medical instructions in the recipe itself. So it's adding additional explanatory information. Now, we turn just to the, another area of conflict, of problems, and that's witchcraft. Now, we have a very large anti-witchcraft corpus, and it shares its characteristics both with magic and with medicine. There are anti-witchcraft corpus incantations, and there are anti-witchcraft corpus medical recipes. So it's a kind of gray area. It forms a large block of material, but it's a very different approach to symptoms and disease. So here's an area of real difference. Huh? Why witchcraft is the result of human agency. And it's, of course, it's human agency results in medical and non-medical difficulties for the patient or client. Huh? And this requires countermeasures of both magic, so you have rituals and incantations, as well as medical-like recipes and prescriptions. Now remember, witchcraft is an interesting area. You don't really need witches to have witchcraft. We don't really have manuals of witchcraft. We only have counter witchcraft. We only, have to, we only have information about what to do about witchcraft. We don't actually have in- manuals that tell us how to do wi- witchcraft. Huh? So it's something that you're afraid of, but we don't really know uh, how, uh, what the process is or how it worked. Huh? But it's man-made. 
It's human agents behind it. So the question is whether witchcraft itself, covering all these subtopics, is this an alternative to magic and medicine while it resembles both? Is it just another voice? Now let's examine this a little bit. I think that anti-witchcraft measures do represent a different voice because human agency was occasionally acknowledged even in the diagnostic handbook. It's not often, but it does occur. The hand of mankind. These are allusions to witchcraft. And you can see that this idea of human agency is here in this quote. And this is quite exceptional. So the man suffers from weakness, also in his epigastrium here. He's bloated. But the illness is the hand of mankind. What do you do? Very unusual. You make a figurine of the man. You put, him in, you put the figurine in a grave. And the exorcist is not allowed to make any prognosis. So this is very exceptional stuff. It's not following the rules. In any case, either as treatment or uh, any, anything else. Now, it's magical. It's not medical. There's no medicine here. The figurine of the patient is buried in the grave. Huh? Now... These are treatments are designed to handle symptoms associated with angry gods or vicious demons or unsympathetic ghosts. These require a certain assortment of strategies, usually attempting to appease to coerce these antagonistic forces. You can sort of know what these are and you can deal with them. But ailments caused by witchcraft or man-made illnesses <laughs> these take on a very different character. They're much more aggressive in attacking witches and agents of witchcraft. Now, within the context of untrammeled infectious disease environments or epidemics or pandemics, we can begin to understand this. Huh? It's easy to imagine how these images would occur when neighbors or even casual acquaintances are suspected of being disease vectors, huh? even resulting from casual contacts, huh? shaking hands. Huh? So it's, in. it's easy to forget that witchcraft can include almost anyone from the patient's immediate environment, including members of one's own family. You can be bewitched by members of your own family. So, so we're looking here, if we look at these different approaches, for sample texts which are possible examples of alternative voices within Babylonian medicine. I'm just going to give you one more example. This is a provincial archive found in Sultan Tepe in eastern Turkey. It's discussed by Stoll in his very commendable book on Epilepsy in Babylonia. Right? And Stolf sees this as an alternative handbook, an alternative diagnostic handbook. I don't think that's right, but I do think it's an alternative kind of approach. It's similar to the diagnostic handbook, but it's different. And it focuses on diseases and specific diseases, which we don't find in the diagnostic handbook. One of them is called Zikurudu, cutting off the breath. The other is called Ziru, hatred. And the third is called aphasia, sort of stroke. Affects the mouth, kade, kadabedu, inability to speak. Now these, these don't have much in common in a physical sense, but they're all characterized by both physical and psychological symptoms. That's the important point. Hmm? For instance, zikurudu, which doesn't feature, it's not in the diagnostic handbook, was, this is a kind of alternative diagnosis, why the idea of shortness of breath explains many of these associated physical symptoms. Vertigo, numbness, paralysis, pain, sort of mental fog, or for forgetfulness, we find this with COVID symptoms as well, huh? which can be associated with influenza causing breathing difficulties. So the idea of breath being cut off has these psychological dimensions as well. Now the alternative series, this one, also refers to a condition, this condition known as hatred, ziru. It's also manifested in physical and psychological symptoms, fever, impotence. But it's not, present, not in, the, in the standard medical prescriptions. And the same is with this kadabedu, this kind of stroke, epilepsy, seizure kind of illness. Huh? And these illnesses are all associated with witchcraft in 
other contexts. And that's the important point. They are associated with human activity. Since this, these prescriptions in this alternative corpus always refer to what we call ipshu epshushu, sorcery has been performed against this patient. And that's the context for the illness. So there's no room for doubt here that a physical and psychic illness can be directly caused by human agency, which places these prescriptions into a very different category of diagnosis than normally encountered in the medical corpus. Now, is this an alternative approach? I think it is. And I think we can understand the issue here a bit better now that we've had two years of experience with COVID-19. The idea of other humans causing disease that becoming a critical issue, it's obvious today. When we see or we read about people refusing to wear face masks on crowded areas or refusing to be vaccinated. Huh? So they potentially become vectors of disease for everyone else. So how does one deal with this kind of situation? It's actually more difficult to deal with human agency than divine agency. So one strategy is to brand all of this kind of human agency as witchcraft as a way of identifying and isolating the problem, as well as labeling it as dangerous to everyone else. So calling people anti-vaxxers and not allowing them to go to work or discos or football matches, this is somewhat follows this same kind of practice. And I think we can understand it with our experience of the last couple of years. So these, what I'm trying to describe, are alternative approaches to healing. These activities. So I just want to come to one final point, and that's this. Who controls the narratives? You know, in later periods of medicine, during the Middle Ages, medicine was dominated by what the Cambridge scholar Roger French referred to as rational and learned scholars who controlled the knowledge of medicine as well as its application. They controlled learning medicine, teaching medicine, applying medicine. Now, they were competing, though, with others. There were other less conservative approaches to medicine, not so reliant upon philosophy, because these learned and rational learned scholars had to be philosophers as well as physicians. So they were competing with other forms of medicine that weren't so concerned with philosophy, but concentrated on instead on treatments. So the argument was that philosophy within medicine was all very well, but it didn't actually cure anybody. So this tension was a continuous feature of medieval medicine. But since there were very few technological advances separating late antique medicine and medieval medicine, in some ways these social patterns are comparable. We can see them looking back and it becomes a useful model for us. So when these rational and learned scholars control the narrative, their own theories, of course based on philosophy, tended to dominate medicine. But, so pet theories and these approaches to healing were widely accepted until, until they were challenged by crises, such as epidemics, which undermined confidence in all accepted theories and practices. So moreover, this technical science was often in com competition with conservative religious ideas which relied heavily, heavily upon trust in the divine being. This is a situation, of course, which we recognize in Mesopotamia. Now, in this Mesopotamian context, the question of controlling the narrative may be more relevant than we usually imagine. Instead of a binary system of Ashiputu exorcism and a Sutu medicine, exorcist versus doctor, a third discipline was clearly influencing approaches to medicine, the office of an expert who visited the patient at home and made the prognosis and diagnosis. This third discipline may have been much more open to new ideas and concepts influenced by advances in astronomy, and especially astrology, which produced alternative forms of diagnosis and even 
therapy. So this picture is still very opaque, and it's difficult to put into sharper focus. But distinguishing between what appears to be standard and deviant prescriptions and observations may point to a much more multifaceted view of Babylonian medicine beyond the usual tensions between religion and science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very stimulating, topical and timely talk. Uh, before we enter into a discussion with you, uh, I would like to make some announcements. If you can hand me the pointer, yeah. Sure. That would be helpful. <laughs> uh, before uh, people would... Uh, Yeah, uh, we will have another event first uh, tomorrow over uh, lunch or noon, a uh, seminar with Professor Florentina Pal uh, patalanova Geller, Slavonic Apocalypse of Enoch, Second Enoch and Qumran Scribal Heritage. This will take place at Kirchgasse 9, a building adjacent to the Großmünchen. You're very welcome, no registration uh, required. will be a talk of about 50 minutes and then we will have the possibility to get into a discussion with uh, Florentina Padalanova uh, Keller. And then uh, on Friday, starting at 14.00 uh, sharp, a workshop over one and a half days with uh, Professor Mark Keller on moral dimensions of treating contamination versus contagion in ancient uh, Mesopotamia. I also would like to draw your attention to the next Zatz lecture of Professor Merle Eisenberg from the University of Oklahoma. He will be the junior uh, Zatz guest professor in this uh, fall term with a talk in three weeks on pandemics as historical actors from the ancient world to COVID-19. This just somehow as a small announcement beforehand and now we have the opportunity to interact and to get into a discussion with uh, Professor Kepp. Please, the floor is open. Yeah, bitte. Just a second, I will come with the mic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Geller, for this very interesting and inspiring speech. Um, I was wondering, so my name is Melanie Carafa, I'm a doctor in theological studies and will soon be writing a habilitation on either epidemics and how to prevent them in ancient cultures or, and this is my second field of research, um, liver diseases in ancient Mesopotamia. So I've got a master's degree in ancient Near Eastern cultures and I was wondering if it comes to liver diseases, um, how large is the tax corpus in Old Babylonian or in Neo-Assyrian? And is there a chance to work specifically on hepatology, on retrospective diagnosis, or is the um, corpus not large enough? Could you give me an answer? Not only is the corpus not very large, but we're not even sure about the word for liver. Huh? It's gabidu and kaved, and it's not a very common word, and it tends to be occur in non-medical contexts. So there's a lot of on, on kidney disease, but the in, and, and we know something about sort of bowel stomach disease, but they, they never dissected human bodies. So the, uh, so the internal anatomy was terra incognita. And it's very, we want to find our modern diseases in these ancient texts. And there's a lot of very poor work that has been done because of that, huh? this retrospective diagnosis. And it's really, the important concept is to try to see 
medicine as a whole and not try to pick out little parts of it and to see if we can relate it to our modern notions of what disease ought to look like. Because they would never be able to imagine this. They would not have any idea what the liver was used for. They didn't know what the heart was used for. They didn't even associate lungs with respiration in Mesopotamia. Why should you? Why should you breathe with your lungs? Huh? You breathe and it comes into your throat and then it goes, and that's it. Huh? You don't need the lungs to be part of respiration at all. Huh? As far as they're concerned, resp- the lungs are part of the digestive system. So there's so many basic differences in how they imagined anatomy and the functions of anatomy and then the functions of disease that it's a great danger to try to pick out any one organ or one part of this system and try to explain it in isolation. So it's perfectly okay to write a habilitation on on the subject of internal anatomy and the concepts of internal anatomy and how this was and how this fits in with concepts of disease, but it's very difficult to be too specific. And, li- hepatol- this, and liver disease is one area I would say it's very dangerous to try to isolate that kind of thing. All right, I hope I don't discourage you too much from your... Many, many thanks for this really very broad lecture with so many interesting perspectives. And of course, the the main point uh, which you put in the foreground remains also very intriguing, the question of medicine and magic always. And uh, I mean, I was thinking when I was listening to your uh, paper in in many moments also at uh, Greek parallels in a way. Because, of course, we have the famous uh, beginning of the Iliad where you have Apollo. It's really the hand of God. I mean, he is actively intervening. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then what is the reaction of the people? They have to find the ritual, how to overcome it, how to, to soothe the, the wrath. And I think sometimes that uh, this sort of difference, it's the same with religion and magic in a way, and, and then even more with med- medicine and magic. It might be also a modern problem, more than it is really an ancient problem in a way. Of course, it was already treated in the medical uh, realm, also in Hippocratic medicine, but if you are on an earlier uh, point, uh, you have probably also simply two levels of the same reality. One reality, and I find it really intriguing, the, 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 the examples if you gave that if his urine is yellow, then it's physically this reason which they give. And therefore, this would be sort of the natural observation that there is really a causal uh, relation between the two things. But at the same time, everybody in this period would have thought what is attributed to Thales, that the world is full of gods. And therefore... Of course, if this natural effect is taking place, then there is also divine agency there, in a way. And and therefore, my impression is that it's rather complementary, and you have this even because, I mean, looking at the Greek tradition, very often there is this simplification of from mythos to logos, which has really been overcome also over the last years, because very typical, for instance, of Empedocles, who is considered to be an avant-garde thinker, mm. in a way. Then, But he brings in the four elements, but these four elements again bear the name. <coughs> Oops. <laughs> bear the names of gods. And and then again that means it's really avant-garde uh, sort of physical yeah. thinking and at the same time this avant-garde physical thinking is then again also uh, covered with uh, with the names of the gods and you were once also talking about this uh, this allegory with this what was it sinu prata or, or how was it which has the double meaning of a goddess Serpanitum. and then also of a medical thing this is probably in a way the reality of a comprehensive you might say also holistic approach to yeah, so this is a very interesting point you raised. So let me just explain from, the, from my perspective. There are two things that are really important points, I think. That is this. That my, the generation of my teachers, for their perspective on Mesopotamia and the world in general, the ancient world, everything was religion. Everything was religious. So the gods were everywhere. They explain everything. Every, every text has to do with religion. There was never the concept among the great, my great teachers of 
Elio Oppenheim or Lambert or uh, uh, Gelb or any of these great uh, scholars, of anything, the idea of secular science didn't exist in Mesopotamia. They never thought about it. There was astronomy, but that's for a few astronomers. That's a kind of niche. Huh? But basically speaking, everybody was thinking in terms of the religion. The gods are everywhere. The gods are interfering with everybody's life. Huh? Now, the reason why we have this perspective is because there's a basic confusion with two kinds of literature. There's narrative and there's technical literature. Now, you take dream omens as a good example of this. So we have lots of stories about dreams. Dreams is a wonderful technical advice in all kinds of narratives. Kings have dreams. Dreams forecast what's going to happen. Pharaoh has dreams. This is seven years of good, good years and seven bad years. Everywhere in the literature, these are narratives. And everybody understands these as narratives. And of course, who brings these dreams? God brings these dreams. So this is something that everybody on the level of narrative, everybody can understand. Then we have a separate literature of dream omens what we call this dream book, technical literature. If you dream this and this, if you dream you're urinating on plants, it's a good dream, it's a bad dream, something good will happen, something bad will happen. Huh? All kinds of things, bizarre things that appear in dreams. They have nothing to do with reality. It's the reality of dreams. But they also have nothing to do with the narratives. Because, you know, when you have a dream, you have a long dream. Huh? We'll talk about this uh, during one of the sessions. I'm going to, one of the sessions will be on dreams. You have a dream, you have a kind of story in your mind, you see a whole story, and then when you see these dream books, it's as if you dream about X or Y. It's very short, huh? a little motif. But this is technical literature. This is for the purpose of, of prognosis and diagnosis and trying to determine what's going to happen. So they're very different. And when we confuse them, then we get this... This muddled idea. And I find this all the time among classicists, that the classicists, classicists talking about medicine, they always start off with Homer. Homer has nothing to do with medicine. It's not a medical work. It's a narrative. Of course, it refers to medicine. It can describe medicine. We know people are ill, they're wounded, they need healing, gods are there, all kinds of things. But this isn't, it's, it's not a medical textbook. It's not Hippocrates. Hippocrates is about technical handbook of healing and we have to separate these genres and keep them separate because otherwise we confuse ourselves and we confuse the picture of the ancient world because there were two very different pictures everybody believed in both huh? you believe in the narratives you believe the gods were there gods are of course taking interest in and our affairs and interfering with our lives. At the same time, you can have technical medicine and technical magic, which is there to offer relief from symptoms, from specific kinds of problems. Huh? Heilkunde, if you want to call it that. Huh? And that's a very different kind of thinking that tries to look at reasons for why things happen and what you can do about it without referring to the gods. Gods are there, you believe in them, but they're not, it's not part of what your object is. You see, this, so this is how I, I respond to this kind of situation. By separating them, we get a much clearer picture of the kind of textual information that we are receiving. And I think that's what's crucial here. Thank you, Professor Geller, for your, your talk, which uh, explained, yeah, as has been said, many, many details in a very clear uh, manner. I have two questions, if I, yeah. I may. The first, uh, where I, I think I didn't understand fully uh, the argument, uh, it's, it has to do with causality versus association of events. Um, you introduced uh, Francesca Rochberg's yes. argument in one uh, I was too brief context. with that. Yes. No, uh, I, I don't <laughs> think so. But when you were talking about witchcraft uh, and the hand of humankind, all of a sudden this hand seemed to have been considered as a causal uh, ah. instance. Whereas the hand of the god was not. And I didn't understand why oh, no. in one case it's this and in another it's that. It, okay, can I respond to this point sure. first? Yes. So 
the idea of causality is uh, uh, not causality of association. Two ideas being associated is this: there's an earthquake, and if there's an earthquake, the wife of the queen, queen uh, king may die. Now, what's this? Does the earthquake cause the wife of the queen? To, no. This is how omens work. These are two ideas which are associated. It could be that at some time in the past, there was an earthquake and the wife of the king died. So you, this is a, something that someone associated in the past. So if it happens again, another earthquake, well, the wife of the queen may be in danger again. Huh? This is association. It's not causality. Yeah. And this same causality is true across the board, even with hand of mankind, huh? even with witchcraft, that these are... Uh, these are these are associations associated ideas that that witchcraft may be associated with the ailment with the disease, but not necessarily causing it individually to the person himself or herself. Huh? It may not be that kind of direct causality in our idea of causality. Because Causal- remember, we are we're very much influenced, whether we like it or not, by Aristotelian logic, by what happens later with Greek philosophy and logic, etc. And it wasn't invented yet. So this idea of association is really a much stronger concept in the, in the, in the Mesopotamian world. And once you get replaced by Aristotelian logic, we, our attitudes change. We see the world a bit differently. We, we reject associations. But association was really the most common way of thinking about the world in this pre, pre-Greek Orient. And so I think that even there with the hand of mankind, it's again, it's association. It's not direct causality because they didn't have this concept of causality. And this Thank is what she shows in her, what Rushberg shows. Yeah, this clarifies the matter, I think. Yeah. Uh, the second question is from... Uh, so to speak, a patient's perspective. Yeah. Would I, as a patient, know from the symptoms I experience I've, whether I should turn to an ASU or to an ASHIPU? So I have or a, is it just availability of services which makes no, no, the no, difference? No, 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 I don't think so. So I have a, you know, I spent uh, eight years at the Freie Universität in Berlin. Uh, until two years ago, and I had a student, in, I still have a student in Berlin who's Iranian, and she comes from a rather southern part, south uh, eastern part of Iran, which she says they don't really consider us proper Muslims in this part of Iran, and she said in every village in this part where I grew up, she said there is a doctor and there is a healer, and you go to both. You don't just trust one or the other you you always you uh, normally situation is to go to both because each is going to offer you something that the other one can't offer you so in that sense it's it's complementary so it's not just a matter of making a calculation should i go see the ashipu exorcist or the asu doctor we don't even know if the asu doctor even, even saw patients he may have just been like an apotheke preparing all of the the drugs we don't really know how the system properly worked. Huh? But I don't think it was that kind of choice one or the other. I think both were there and they used both of them. But there is one difference though. The Ashipu is a priest. Priests have two things that the Asu doesn't have. Number one, he has prestige. Everybody respects the priest. Number two, he's rich. Temples are rich. Ashipus are rich. That's fat like a priest. Huh? The Asu sells his drugs in a carpet sitting on the street selling his drugs to... He's an entrepreneur, you know, private entrepreneur. He doesn't have the status of the priest. Huh? So they're very different social picture between these two professions. Huh? And we have to always take this into account. I am interested in this medical omina uh, that uh, are... Uh, phrased as a conditional clause and the apotheosis is he will die. Many of your examples simply included uh, the result, he will die. Of course, I think every mortal uh, will die at uh, some point. This is apparently not in view, but he will 
die anytime soon. But what's the concept of medicine that is related to this prognosis? Is it somehow if, uh, if something somehow leads or will lead to the secure result that someone will die, is this somehow to say uh, here our medicine, our medical expertise ends no. or mm -hmm. is limited or is it, a, is it a statement about we know uh, we, we can't do anything and uh, it's, yeah. it, it's just a, a prognosis uh, that, that is safe and surely will lead to the death of the, of the person diagnosed. So, so there are three different answers to your question. It's a very good question. The first answer is this. It's, these texts are mistranslated. Because as you know, in Semitic languages, the imperfect can be modal as well as indicative. So it doesn't necessarily mean he will die. It could mean he may die. He could die. He should die. Huh? He might, might die. Huh? All of these are possible. Huh? And we translate very literally. He will die, but that's actually not a very good translation because omens really don't predict what will happen, they really predict what might happen. That's also part of this associative thinking. Huh? So, you know, we don't know, is it will it rain tomorrow or might it rain tomorrow? It makes a big difference. Huh? So, so that's the first thing. On the other hand, you're right. Many more of these omens say he might die because you didn't, we don't have these reports of the physician or the exorcist coming to the man's house when he just has a cold or a sore throat. These patients are usually critically ill. And it's the same thing in the Hippocratic Corpus. The Hippocratic Corpus talks about acute disease. The doctor comes when the patient is really dying. He's on his deathbed. Huh? And then he comes to give the prognosis. How much longer is he going to live? Well, he may, may have three days and uh, maybe a week. Huh? So that's part of the fact that this is the context of when we have these texts, that they're describing diseases and acute cases of disease. So it's likely that the patient would die, yeah? should die. But there's another thing which is interesting, and that is, this is only typical of the magical corpus, of, this, of the ashipu. The asu corpus, the medical corpus, at the end of the recipes, most of the time says, the patient will get better. He's going to live. Huh? And it's exactly the same. He may live, or maybe get better, should get better. Huh? could get better, this is, but this is, and, that, and it's not the formulation of the magical incantations. They don't say this. Eh? It's the recipes, 80% of the time, end with this formulation. So the recipes are much more optimistic than the incantations, and we don't know why that, why that is. But it's a really interesting difference between the two. So thank you so much. It was really interesting to have a look into this different kind of medicine. And I have just one question to one of the last points you made. And you said that all this disease had physical and also psychological aspects. So before I misinterpret that, um, what was the concept of psychology in these times? And did they have recipes for this part of the disease or was it just they knew that there was some psychological part, but the recipes were more for, for the anatomical stuff. No, no, they, there is no real gattung, medical gattung for psychology. This is a modern idea. Hmm? But they do have medical recipes for people who are suffering from anxiety, or excessive fear, or other kinds of things that we would associate. We call it psychological. They don't, but we do. Hmm? And these are, and they're not incantations, because normally we think, well, magic would refer to the psychology of, of the person, and medicine should treat the physical symptoms. But it's much, much more complicated than that. So we have medical recipes dealing with things like anxiety. But the recipes are not the traditional medical recipes of grinding up some plants necessarily. And bring, but they're often, for instance, the radical recipes for anxieties will say, you have to hang an amulet around the person's neck with certain kinds of amulet stones and exotic ingredients, and this will help them. We think, well, all right, that sounds very magical. But Galen makes the same kind of recommendations for his patients. Galen's hardly a magician, huh? 
Galen's really, a, there's no question of Galen being a doctor. But he says, in some cases, you need to prescribe an amulet because it might help. The patient might feel better. Huh? So there was this basic understanding that, some, that when you're dealing with these kinds of problems that are, manifest themselves as, as anxiety or other kinds of psychological impotence is another one. Uh, so you have to find other kinds of remedies, but even within the medical corpus, you could find remedies for this. So there wasn't this clear distinction in that way. One little question uh, is regarding also sort of the political uh, situation. Because, I mean, when one says who controls the narrative, one would think mm. also of the role of the king in Babylonia. And I think also that you have this kind of different schools in the, in the Greek-Roman world might also partly be due also to this uh, fact. I mean, what was the role, therefore, of, of the king? I mean, he would. you said there were no witches and we have no wi manuals of witches probably because scribes and, uh, and the possibility to copy texts was really also a question of political authority, whether you could do that or not, and whether it was preserved afterwards. But then we have still this uh, bifurcation, which is more than bifurcation, but uh, various facets, and these facets obviously were accepted by the, the political authority. Or how would you uh, see the role of the king in all well, this? Asher Banipal was a bit unusual because he took a personal interest. Well, he never wanted to be king. He wanted to be a scholar. His brother died and he was forced to be, to be king. Huh? But he still maintained his interest by creating this wonderful library in Nineveh. And he took active interest and even claimed credit. I think his, his scribes must have been really annoyed because they were never mentioned by name and he takes credit for, for everything. All of them have his name on the colophons. None of the scribes' name who actually did the work. Huh? But that's very unusual. The king doesn't really normally mix mix into these production of literary things. But if you take the interesting case of the witch, you don't need witches to have witchcraft. All you have to do is to be afraid of witches. Witches are anonymous. We don't know who the witch is. All we know is somebody out there hates me. Somebody out there is doing something bad against me. I don't know whether it's my colleague, member of my family, someone I just had coffee with, someone I met... I don't know, but I've got to protect myself against this evil eye, this evil influence. Huh? Now, it doesn't actually have to exist in order for us to be afraid of it. Huh? And, it's a, and it's a very highly developed system of describing what we would call in modern terms paranoia, perhaps. Huh? Anxieties, fears, but aimed at, this is aimed at humans causing this, not gods, not demons. And it's easier to deal with demons. We know how to deal with demons. We have the incantations for demons. Dealing with witchcraft is really difficult because it could be anybody. <laughs> someone we know, someone we don't know. And, and, it, and, we don't, and it doesn't really have to exist except here in order for it to be real. Huh? Enough fun for one evening? <laughs> we would have uh, time maybe for one final question, but if there is... Yep, Jordan. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, yeah, you sort of started by thought process there. Is there a logic that certain things are attributed to gods rather than demons and then other ones? Is there some kind of classification... Uh, okay, the that's two. a good question. So uh, there are different categories. There are, there are angry gods, hmm? and then there are demons sent by gods. So the gods are always there in the background somewhere. Now, you know, if you were Freud, if Freud was reading this material, he would have all the answers for us. Huh? Freud would have, really, he would have really enjoyed this. He never really knew this material, unfortunately, because we would have had a Gilgamesh complex. Huh? So... <laughs> So the point is, is that, that the idea here that uh, gods are angry with me, Freud would say, well, this is like someone who's, who has feelings about his father and parents or bad relations with his father. The, this feeling that I'm... Freud would have said that the, there's a basic difference between someone who considers himself to be at fault. Why am I ill? It's because I'm guilty. 
I've done something wrong. Not because some other external agent has done something to me, and I'm perfectly innocent, but it just happened to me because it's a demon who's attacked me. This case, I, am, I must have done something wrong. The gods are angry, and that's why I'm ill. And that's the explanation for real. So, and we have different incantations that are tailored for just these kind of feelings. There's a, the Ashipu had a kind of repertoire, and he had to have the common sense to see what his patient was like. Huh? Is this patient suffering from feelings of guilt? Is he, is he angry because he's, he's ill and he shouldn't be? Uh, he's feeling that he's innocent. He's been unfairly attacked. It's not fair. Why me? Why not my neighbor? He's a much worse person than I am. So, you see, so the Ashipu would have to have some kind of feeling for human nature, like we see in the Greek texts, huh? to be able to take his from his repertoire of magical texts and apply them correctly to the situation. So yes, the answer to your question is yes, there are differences, huh? important differences. But the Ashipu, ha- a good Ashipu had to know what these differences were. So thank you very much, Professor Geller, for uh, your talk. And the interesting discussion, also thanks to the discussants. Uh, before I invite you to the Aporo, I would like to draw your attention here to the material that is available here. The annual reports of the ZATS, the Zentrum Altertumswissenschaften Zürich, from 19, uh, 2019 and 2020. You also find a documentation if you plan to become a sponsor or donor for the ZATS. This is also uh, important uh, here among this material. Now I uh, have the privilege to invite you uh, to what is called in Switzerland uh, an apero. This is an institution that is also known from France and Luxembourg. It includes some snacks and bever- beverages that may or may not be of uh, alcoholic uh, nature. This will take place down in the Lichthof, you know on which side, on our side, probably? Beim Sofa. Sofa. So on the other side of the Lichthof, and uh, we'd be very glad if uh, many of you could join us. And there is, of course, also the opportunity to continue talks with uh, Professor Mark Geller or initiate talks with Professor Florentina Padalanova Geller. See you soon, and thanks again.